All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and just seek him and ask him to guide our steps tonight as we go through this book. So, Father, we thank you for our study tonight. We thank you for the time to gather as we uh, re-engage on our Wednesday night studies. We pray you will bless this study in Amos. This is the first time I've actually really gone through and teaching on it. And, and Lord, I just pray that you just, just pour out your spirit and, and show us what you want us to see and teach us what we need to hear. And we thank you for the night, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're online and this you, this is your first Wednesday. Oh, okay, yeah, the amps aren't on. Well, you know, that, that's because whoever turned everything on just didn't turn it all on like he was supposed to. That was me. <laughs> I knew I forgot something. Anyway, um, hey, now, there, hey, 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 turn it off, turn it off. Um, we, in, we know that, uh, for those who are, who are listening online, we've, um, we've decided we're going to, um, just start right into our studies on Wednesdays right now. So we're not doing a worship time during our, on Wednesday night studies. And, uh, hopefully that gives everybody just kind of a little bit more rest, a little bit more break. And when we dive into the study, we're just going to dive in. We, we might finish up a little early, but you know, we might not. You're not counting on it. Okay, well, a lot of that's up to you because, as you know, on our Wednesday services, this is an engaging time. So you have time to ask questions and intervene, and, and if you have any comments, feel free to do so. So we're going to dive into Amos. We're in Amos chapter 1. And uh, just opening as an introduction, I'll tell you up front, I don't have a lot of information on this prophet. He's not mentioned anywhere else, really, in Scripture. Um, and outside of his own testimony in his introduction... We get a lot more and glean a lot more there. So let's go ahead and dive in, and uh, we'll find out uh, more about him as we go. Amos chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. Mm. So... We know this much about him based on the fact that Israel was already divided. We had the northern tribes, the ten tribes, the northern uh, Israel, and then we had Judah. They were already separated under different kings. And during the king uh, uh, reign of Uzziah, who was the king of Judah, and the Jeroboam, the son of Joash, which is king of Israel, this was a time period that, that we see here in Scripture that Amos was, was, uh, was a prophet. It was around 760 to uh, 750 B.C during that time frame. Amos lived actually in Judah near Jerusalem. Decorah was about probably uh, maybe six to 10 miles from Jerusalem. But when he was called, he was called to be a prophet actually in Israel. He, he went across up into the northern tribes and that's where his ministry actually began. Um, there was nothing special about this man. He was, he was, he was a farmer. He was a sheep, he, he described himself as a sheep breeder did not describe himself as a shepherd. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, the type of sheep that they say he might have raised was a long-haired type sheep that had really had a lot of wool, mm -hmm. but they didn't, he didn't call himself a shepherd. He said, I'm a sheep breeder, uh, which is very interesting. And if we go to Amos 7 real quick, uh, 714, it gives us a little bit more about what he was doing there too. It says, Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Hmm. So basically, he tended sheep and he picked figs. <laughs> that, was, that was who he was. He was a country boy. He was out there in the middle of a, uh, a land that really didn't have a lot going on. And then, of course, you know, you had, again, the, the whole separation of Israel and Judah. And so as we, as we see him, we, we kind of get a similar look at him as we did of David. Now, David was a shepherd, and they called him a shepherd. He was a young shepherd. But he was, he was out there in the fields when, um, when Samuel came because God said, Go to Je the home of Jesse, and I'm going to show you who you're going to raise up as the next king of Israel. So here, here Samuel goes, and all of these sons, sons start you know, being paraded across, and they're all tall and handsome, and said, No, not that one. No, not that one. No, not that one. Gets all the way to so well, is there any more left? It's just the run out in the field, basically. <laughs> and they brought him, and that's the one God chose. But what we see in this same situation is that God always looks at the heart. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. God doesn't look at the person on the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. And it's the same thing we see here. Uh, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, this is what he told Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see man as he sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Mm -hmm. And so we know that God has a plan that's outside of what we sometimes can see or think or feel should be the right thing. You know, our, our mindset still sometimes follow the world's wisdom. Well, he's got the looks and the charm and he's able to speak and he's able to do all these things. He must be called. He must be the one. But God has a different plan. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, we covered this already in our study in Corinthians, but it says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, and not many mighty, not many noble are called. <coughs> But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. See, God is very, very clear that he will not let anything of pride get in the way of what he's doing and sometimes the smart ones the handsome ones the ones that seem on the outside to have it all going for them they also tend to have a little bit of pride because most of their life they've been told how good they are when sometimes they look in the mirror and they think look how good I am and God says look it's not about any of those things and so it's all about this now so we get back now here to to the first verse and he mentions this earthquake, and it's interesting because there's no real historical record of this earthquake listed anywhere else in Scripture except there's two places. One is in Zechariah 14.5, and he says, he, again, in his prophecy, he's saying, Then you shall flee through my, uh, through my mountain valley, for the mountain shall reach to Azale. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with you. And then Josephus, the, the famous historian that a lot of people refer to, he stated that this earthquake took place also during the reign of, of Uzziah. Um, so again, we know nothing about the earthquake. I don't know why it's mentioned as blatantly as it is, because it's like right in your face in the, you know, two years before the earthquake. And then Zechariah mentions it and says, hey, it's just like it was in that day of that big earthquake. Mm -hmm. But historically, we don't really have in this in this rain or in this season when it really took place. But but is that how God disciplines His children? Sometimes it is. Yes, He has disciplined His children through earthquakes, through various other ways too. Right. You know, and yeah. so yeah, so that's a good point. And it very and, and I believe as you go through, I was just telling um, to, I, I was telling Debbie earlier we were talking, you know, and going into the Book of Amos, it's like you know. We just came out of the book of Isaiah. Yeah. And almost all of the prophet books, it's judgment. <laughs> it just seems like it's always judgment. And what we try to do is we kind of glean what they were doing in that time, what was going on, but at the same time, we bring it forward to today and kind of compare. So we'll be doing those same things. But God's judgment in those days particularly sometimes was a violent judgment because he allowed things to happen to a point and said the line was drawn. And, you know, in one case, a whole an earthquake swallowed up a whole clan of people yeah. just because of their rebellion against Moses. Swallowed them whole. Um, so yeah, that is, that is very true. Um, so we look at this, we also see because of this timeline, Amos uh, was a contemporary with Hosea. Hosea was also probably alive during the same time period that Amos was. So that gives us just a little bit of knowledge about who he was, where he came from, and how he's just one day out there tending or herding the sheep and then God calls him, says go. And that's what he says. He said, I was out doing this. God said, go. So here he is. So any thoughts on, on, on that so far? I know we don't have a lot really that we haven't discussed, but any thoughts on Amos? Any thoughts on, on what we covered? Well, this is the part where he says that God chooses the things that seem ridiculous to the world or base. When I first read those words, I did my happy dance because <laughs> I felt like, yeah, so God can use me. Yeah, I know. I, I know that same feeling. I really do. You know that it really does open your eyes to the fact that 
you know, every one of us as a believer has a place in the kingdom of God. Number one, we're all, in, in, you know, inheritance of the kingdom now. We are adopted into the kingdom. So we have that. But while we're still here, we also have giftings that he wants to give us. We have a call on our life that he wants to use us for. And it may not be uh, what, what we would, even our fleshly mindset would desire to do. But whatever it is, it's the right thing. Because he always puts uh, and calls according to his plan. And his plan is always a perfect plan. So who he uses is going to be the perfect person to use. Maybe not in, in the fleshly eyes, but definitely in the spiritual realm. And that is a, that is a wonderful uh, uh, thing to recognize is that, look, yeah, God can use me. Yeah. Yeah, it also shows his humility. You know, here, I mean, I'm just a man doing my thing. Yeah. You know, and I'm, not, I'm and I'm God's going to use me. You know, God's going to use me. Yeah. So he wasn't. You know, there was a humbleness to it. There is, and that is a key aspect of being called and used by God. Humility has to be in place. If it's not, it's going to get in the way. It will show up somewhere along the line. Pride will enter in, uh, and it will. You know, it happened with Saul. You know, King Saul had pride, and um, he was tall. He was handsome. Stood a head and shoulders above everybody else. He was very easy to be seen. Oh, he's the one. People chose him. Right. And People I, wanted him. God didn't. And I see kind of like a parallel to Christ. Christ came from a simple family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Simple yeah. people. He was mm -hmm. a carpenter. He wasn't right. anything special in that aspect. There, there's he's, even a passage that describes him. He was a lowly man, really without any stature. Right. He was mm -hmm. just, just mm -hmm. a regular. I mean, he wouldn't have been picked out in the crowd as no. something special. No. Um, you're right. And that's, impor that's important to see. God has the same mi uh, mindset as he goes through. He uses who he sees mm -hmm. that he can use that's moldable, that's shapeable, and that just re recognize himself as a vessel, nothing more. As a servant, servant's heart. And because, servant's heart. Because look at all of them. Mm -hmm. They didn't argue, well, Jonah did, but. Yeah. <laughs> Jonah's the only one who got away with it, yes, too. It but he, had, he suffered. Yes, you know, I mean, winding up in fish bomb, it isn't a pleasant place to be, but, you know, he, he suffered for it, but he was rebellious in the sense that he mouthed off a little bit. He did, yes, yes. But this, he left everything, and, and look, David was so, so a servant-minded. Mm -hmm. And how many of them are? God didn't choose Saul. Right. The people chose Saul. That's right, and God told Samuel, because Samuel was upset, he said, don't be upset, they're not rejecting you, they're right. rejecting me. Right. Mm -hmm. But give them what they want. And when I give you, when you, when, and, but he's gonna tell them what, what they're gonna get. Right. He, and they got that more yeah. with Saul, you know? Yeah. Um, one thing that this uh, past, this, what we just read reminds me of was when Jesus says about the, uh, do not deny the, the, the children to come on to me. Mm -hmm. It says that we need to be like that child. And Very so it's like that child, it doesn't have all the knowledge yet. It doesn't have all the other stuff that's filling its mind with uh, and everything, yeah. But God is God. God wants us to be as a child. Yeah, that's right. And you can almost see that simplicity of the mindset of Amos. It's like, okay, I was just out here doing my thing, and God said go, so I just went. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I just when it says on the Uzziah, that's that struck out stuff to me because Uzziah was compared to all the other kings that, that they had. He was a good king. Yeah. In comparison. In comparison. <laughs> he had a flaw, which he paid for at the end, yeah. which you talk about pride. But this is a time of prosperity. Yeah. He had, uh, it's a, whatever he did, he, he, he prospered in whatever he did, because mm -hmm. the Lord was with him mm -hmm. until his heart got lifted up. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this is, it's just interesting, interesting that this prophecy would come at a time where you think things are going well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the surface, they're going well. There's money yeah. in the bank. There's, there's, yeah, they, they, there's no nations attacking them. The army is strong. He, they say he, he was able to build, like, have inventions of, of instruments of war. That's how, yeah. that's how, how advanced he got. But his, his heart got lifted up in pride. Yeah, that's right. So, and what we see too is, is that, um, and we'll get into this in just a minute. As, as, as the prophecy begins and the judgment is pronounced, you don't hear anybody complaining about what he's saying initially because he's not speaking about Israel just yet. He starts with the judgment of other nations, and then it leads into the judgment on Judah. And the judge. Then they come and they send somebody, look, man, you need to get on, you know, we don't, we don't want to hear that. It's because things were going good, and we'll get to that point when we get there. 
Um, but let's go ahead and, and, and begin in verse 2. This is where he begins his, uh, his uh, judgment and his prophecy. And he said, the Lord roars from Zion. And we can stop right there for just a second. I mean, that's when God is roaring, a roaring lion, mm -hmm. he's getting their attention. He's saying, listen, God is not just making a statement here. He's roaring this statement like a lion. There's something big happening here. And he utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions, of Damascus and for four I will not turn away its punishment because they have threshed Gilead with implements of iron but I will send a fire into the house of Hazael which will devour the palaces of Ben Hadad I will also break the gate bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter from the Beth Eden or from Beth Eden the people of Syria shall go captive to Kir says the Lord Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they took captive the whole captivity to deliver them up to Edom. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, which will devour its palaces. I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod, and the one who holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my head against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord God. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they delivered up the whole captivity to Edom, and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. But I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, which will devour its palaces. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will, turn, will not turn away its punishment, because he pursued his brother with a sword and cast off all pity. His anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. But I will send a fire upon Teman, which shall devour the palaces of Bozrah. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they ripped open the womb of the women with child in Gilead, that they might enlarge their territory. But I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour its palaces amid shouting in the day of battle, and a tempest in the day of the whirlwind. Their king shall go into captivity, and his princes together, says the Lord. Any comments on those verses before we kind of dive in a little bit? <laughs> judgment's coming right I mean that, that was it he calls out these five particular nations and he's not done yet it starts back up again in chapter 2 there'll be a couple of more that he calls out then he gets into Israel and into Judah but so what he's saying here um, this prophecy right now is directed toward um, Syria toward uh, Tyre Lebanon Eden uh, or Eblon, uh, I'm sorry Lebanon Edom and Ammon uh, of course, this is the area of the Philistines. Some of these are uh, in Syria. Damascus is the capital of Syria. So he's talking about certain cities and certain nations that he's speaking of here. But notice the phrase that he repeats in every one of these particular judgments. He says, for three transgressions and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Now, we can look at this and say, well, are, have, they just, have they just sinned one time too many? Three transgressions, but now the fourth one, that's it? No, I don't think it's talking about a number of transactions, but it's more of a picture of habitual rebellion. It's an ongoing thing. It, it's it, it's kind of hard to describe it this way, but think of it when, when Jesus said, you know, when Peter said, how many times should I forgive? 70 times, or seven times seven. He said, no, 70 times seven. Jesus wasn't talking about the mathematical no. equation. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing thing. You have to forgive continually. Well, in a situation like this, these people were continually acting out in rebellion against God. And because of that, um, I wonder what that was. My little foot rest, there it is. Um, because of that, you know, the, the, the prophecy of judgment now has come. God always brings judgment on sin. Always.
always. It may not be in a timeline that people would expect, or in some cases people would want, <laughs> because you know some people that are oppressed they want to see they want to see immediate result. They want to see the oppression gone. They want to see everything fixed. They want to see the the ones that the oppressors. They want to see that judgment. But God sees the big picture. He always sees the big picture. But when the time comes, the time comes. And God says, now is the time. I'm telling you, this is going to happen. And every one of these things happened just the way he said it, it, it would. Um, all of them were engaging in, in, in selling slavery. They were sell, selling their brothers to eat them. Uh, the, the, they were talking about iron. You talking about uh, mentioning iron just a minute ago with the uh, with the one nation that they were, they were just getting, you know, Uzziah was getting more and more powerful and in a sense maybe wanting to build things of, of metal and war or whatever it might be. There was all kinds of things that they were doing. But what God is saying, listen, everything that you guys have done, I'm telling you now I'm bringing judgment on and it's going to come down hard. And notice also he, um, he mentions fire in every one of these judgments. I'm going to bring fire upon your wall. I'm going to bring fire upon your gate. I'm going to bring fire upon you and destroy it with fire. It's really interesting because God is a judgment. I mean, his final judgment is going to be in fire. I'm going to get to that as we get to the end of the study tonight. But fire is a big part of who God is. Mm -hmm. You know, his holiness. Is, 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 it's like if, if you look at the description of what John described Jesus, you know, you, you, this, this, this fiery you know, Jesus there, a powerful Jesus, and it was just like a consuming fire. And one of the passages we have is he is a consuming fire. But Hebrews 12, 25 through 29 says, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they do not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven? Whose voice then shook the earth? But now he is promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Mm. Now this, yes, once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. And he is going to test everything through fire. We see that in Corinthians, talking about the works of, of, of believers. Those, those works will be tested by fire. And they will see what stands and what doesn't. It's not talking about losing salvation. It's not talking about you know, somebody not making it to heaven. What it says is, listen, if, if you build a foundation of your works, your Christian faith and your works and what you think you need to do, if you're building with precious stones, you know, the, the, the silver, the gold, the jewels and all that, or if you build with sticks and walk straw and hay, the fire is going to be going to test it. And what can endure the fire remains well and good, but what's burned up is burned up. And this is kind of the similar thing. When God brings a test of fire, sometimes he's testing us as believers for the purification's sake. He's not testing us with fire to destroy us. But that fire, the testing of that fire it, it purifies us. It burns away all the stuff he doesn't want in us. And I can tell you this, I think all of us have experienced it. When we've gone through any really difficult season as a believer, what's the first thing that we typically want to do <coughs> is get closer to God. Mm -hmm. Well, get out of it. It's yeah. the biggest. That's the first thing. But, you know, when God says no, then we want to get close to him. Because he doesn't always remove the fire. He uses the fire in order to bring us through that, and then we're more pure, we're more holy, because he's holy. And, that's, and the scripture says, be holy for I'm holy. Well, what does that mean to be holy because he is holy? It means that that should be the ultimate desire of our heart is to, is to achieve that holiness. But the only way to do that is his holiness in us because we have no holiness without him. So his holiness in us is what makes us holy. But that holiness in us, because we are a temple of the Holy Spirit, he wants to cleanse us. The temple, I mean, if we're a temple, we're supposed to be a cleansed temple to house the Holy Spirit. So we go through these things that we go through, and it burns that off. But when you're looking at the judgment fire, it's going to be all-consuming. And that's what happened here. He says, all of these things are going to take place. I'm going to set with fire. I'm going to destroy it. 
And these places are in ruins after this judgment. They're all in ruins after this judgment because all of these things came to be. Now, we can look at this also. You look at the book of Revelation. We see God's judgment with fire there. And that's really the last outpouring of fire upon, upon the earth and upon man himself. There's the lake of fire, which Satan and, and non-believers and the beast, all of them will be cast into. But the fire itself, talking about destructive fire, really takes place during the last battle uh, here on earth. In Revelation 20, 7 through 9, it says, now ten, uh, it says, When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Mm -hmm. Now that is the last battle, the huge last battle to take place before the great white throne judgment. We're now past the thousand-year reign. Satan has been released to stir up trouble. He's gathered these nations together, and God devours them with fire. And that's interesting. It's interesting because, again, when you're looking at what, what, what Amos is talking about here, is Amos is going through, and he's, he's bringing these judgments. He's not giving them any hope in the judgments he's bringing. And a lot of times we, when we went through Isaiah... We would read a, a passage of judgment, but then we'd see that gleam of hope, you know, because God it's God's people that Isaiah predominantly was prophesying to. And, and it will be here in Amos too at certain points, but, but along with Isaiah, along with all the prophets, they were called to speak what God said to speak at the time. And so what they were speaking was, listen, God is telling you you're out of line. Now think of it too. A lot of these nations God used. God used some of these nations just like he used Babylon. He, took, he, he put Israel in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. It was all prophesied that that was going to take place. It was judgment against Israel, but God used them in a sense to protect Israel while they were there. It guarded the bloodline of the Jewish people while they were there. God somewhat protected them there. But later, judgment came on Babylon. Why? Because they still went in and took captive Israel. And then you have the Syrians, and you have the Medes, and you have all of these different groups all the way down the line, and each one had a role that God may have used them in, but then somewhere along the line, they were destroyed. And as some people might look at that and say, well, that's just unfair, isn't it? I mean, how would, how would God use certain nations and, and then go and turn around and, and, and destroy them all? Listen. You're looking at a God who sees everything we don't see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he sees the heart, and this, in these cases, the hearts of the nations. Where the, where the leaders were, the nations went. And there was no hope for them. If you go back in, in Deuteronomy and go back uh, into Exodus and you see where um, God said, listen, in this case, don't destroy the entire nation. You destroy these, do this, do this and take captive these. But there were specific nations that he said, wipe it all out, including the farm animals. They were also corrupt because they were used in corrupt ways by the leaders of those nations. Right. And again, you know, in, in, in a finite mind, in a way where we're trying to see what's fair, what's fair, what's not fair, you know, it's easy to insert, well, surely there was one, was there? Because had been there one, he would spare the one. He spared the one and her family. And when they were when they walked around and, and the walls came tumbling down, mm -hmm. the one the one uh, harlot, he spared. But nobody else in that whole town outside her and in her family did he spare. But she was brave enough to hide the spies. Yes. she took a, a step into maybe her own life, giving her life for her. Oh, she was. She, she definitely did. But she also knew what was about to happen. Yeah. I think God had given her some insight saying, listen, mm -hmm. this is the way it's going to come down. What are you going to do? Yeah, she and said that it, I, I, we heard what happened in Egypt. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. We heard, yeah. We, so my, me and my family spare us. So right. she had the cord hanging down. 
They went around, everything else collapsed, but she survived. And notice where she found herself in the bloodline. Mm -hmm. You know, she was actually one of the descendants of, of Jesus himself and his bloodline. So you see all of these things. God sees the hearts of the people, but there are some of these nations that were depraved and they were not, there was no hope for them. They wiped them out. Um, or they were supposed to. Again, that was Israel's downfall earlier on, is that they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Had they walked in faith and walked in God's strength and in his power, they would have done exactly what he, they told them to do, wipe these lands out. But if you notice, a lot of these nations that we're looking at are nations that are descendants from those that didn't get wiped out that were supposed to. So they didn't change. Tells you again, the heart is what God looks at. So God is a God who is holy. God is a guy, a God who is uh, who who is righteous and sovereign, but He is also merciful. Mm -hmm. And 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 you can see His mercy in everything that He does, even in the Old Testament here. But when He reached out and He said, "Okay, it's time for judgment to be spoken." Now, also keep this in mind as we go through this book, just like we did in Isaiah. A lot of times, the judgments didn't take place right then. It's coming. It's coming. And if you look at this earthquake, maybe this is part of the, you know, we talked about God using earthquakes as judgment. Um, this was two years before the earthquake. So it, it, if we look at it in the literal sense there, it was possibly when he started prophesying, two years went by before a great earthquake took place, and that could have been what began the whole, the whole process. But God raised nation against others too and used different ways to bring them down. So we, we're seeing here the same thing that we saw in, in every um, historical aspect of Israel. Israel themselves were a rebellious people. Fast forward to today, people today are rebellious people. Mm -hmm. You know, Christians today, a lot of them are rebellious. And Israel still is. And Israel still is in that same place of rebellion. They've rejected their, their Messiah. Right. They rejected. But we see how God brings judgment through. Then there will be a period to where Israel will repent. And then after things settle down, just like it is right now, mm -hmm. and you mentioned it a while ago, Johnny, these guys, they were settled. They were, they were, they were doing well. Mm -hmm. It was a time of prosperity for them. But that sometimes is the most dangerous time mm -hmm. in a walk with God. It's the most yeah. dangerous time during the time of prosperity because it's so easy to see the prosperity and the comforts and the pleasures of all the stuff that you have. And so easy then to take your eye off of the one who blessed you with all of it. And now he has to come in and says, you're worshiping, you, you, you brought idolatry back into the mix. You know, and not only do they just not give him the credit, they then start going after other gods. Mm -hmm. Because, see, here's the thing: if you're a person who is a pleasure seeker, mm -hmm. all of the false gods are lying gods that will make you believe there's something good to pleasure you out of it. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of the yeah, that's right. And, and it's the lust of the eye, the lust of the eye, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of, of life. That's the same exact thing that goes all the way back to what Eve experienced with Satan in the garden. It looks good, touch it. If it looks good, it's bound to taste good. What is it pleasing? The taste buds. It's pleasing the eyesight. It's pleasing to the touch. It's pleasing. Well, surely God didn't say you would die. I mean, surely that's not what he said. I mean, so he draws her in through pleasure of what or what will be pleasure, and then to the point of saying, and also, you won't really die. What, what God doesn't want you to, he, he knows that you're going to be like him. And you're going to be, you're going to know stuff. You're going to be wise and, and, and know all the things that he doesn't really want you to know. Well, wait a minute. Not only can I enjoy things more, I'll know, I'll have the wisdom like God would have in she, she was consumed with then the desire of the flesh. And then, boom. And here we are today. And the and same game plan. Satan doesn't have a different game plan. Mm -mm. But he used the same plan all the way through with Israel. And God warned them. 
He told this is one of the reasons he told them to destroy certain nations. One of the main things he said, listen, if you take any of these women as your wives, they will be your downfall. They will lead you to their gods, and you will depart from me and go into idolatry, serving their gods. And this is what happened over and over and over. And even the wisest man known, that was his downfall. Solomon himself. I mean, what, 700 wives or 400 wives and 700, 700 concubines wives, or 400, what are the other? Wives. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, a bunch of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and it says that he in his latter days <coughs> was fought, were following their gods. Or if if not literally, he was catering, mm -hmm. building temples for his wives. Right. And you know, he spent time in there because mm -hmm. this was going to be mad at him if he didn't. Well, you went in so and so temple, you didn't go into mine. <laughs> You gotta come into my temple. You went, you know. I mean, you got a thousand women to please. Come on. <laughs> I mean, you know. I'm gonna shut up on that one. But the thing is, <laughs> the thing is, is that it, that if you're not walking in relationship with God, you'll never you'll you'll find yourself following something else, and it will lead you down the wrong path every single time. Israel struggled with it over and over and over. And again, we saw them crying out to God. Oh, God, well, you know, we're, we're, we're so sorry. What have we done? We recognize. We did this. We do that. And it's all these words and all these prayers and, and all of these tears sometimes. And then God relented. He gave them relief from, the, uh, from the whatever they were going through. And then here they go again. It's just a, an endless cycle. The fleshly cycle is the same and it always goes in the same circle. The only thing that can intervene in that is God himself. Mm -hmm. A relationship with Jesus Christ for us today breaks this cycle that they were going through then. Now, we don't have prophets today that we had then coming around saying, hey, if you don't straighten up, you know, your whole land's going to burn down. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need a couple of those prophets today. I don't know. I do believe that God still judges nations though. I do believe he allows things to go to a certain point. Mm -hmm. Now you can look at history within itself and every great nation that ever rose to power pretty much dissolved within 200 to 300 years, historically speaking. And that, can, that, that, that speaks volumes to where we are today. Mm -hmm. But what happens? Pride, mm -hmm. power, greed, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life, Corruption then enters in. Corruption gets into their governments. The next thing you know, they begin to implode from within. Now, many of these nations didn't get taken over from the outside until they were pretty much done on the inside. And it's because the, the, the cycle continued and they, and they fall and they crumble. So what does that tell us again about today? Yes, we're in a new covenant. We're not under the covenant of the law. We're not under the nation covenant as, as Israel was but we're under a new covenant. Mm -hmm. And that new covenant directs us to be in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit that we have dwelling in us, through the Word of God, and this should be our focus. And if it's not our focus, then we too have been distracted, and if not careful, we will be turned away and find ourselves self-satisfying uh, self and being self-dependent again, and, and trying to be independent from God and God won't have any part of that mm -hmm. you know he, he's going to bring the correction that needs to be brought so the the question is is you know you see these earthquakes going on around today you see uh, you know hurricanes happening you see all kinds of volcanoes happening you know that one big huge volcano in the ocean is a has attributed to the global warming that we are experiencing <laughs> this year by the way about one and a half to two degrees Celsius increase which was predicted for over two years it was going to happen all the scientists agreed that was going to happen once it happened they all shut up and it's all global warming now it's all yeah. climate change yeah. <laughs> has nothing to do with that earthquake anymore it's, it's again uh, Jennifer and I were talking about this last night the deception mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am convinced that these people that are that are following the deception in the world's lives today 
I believe that they, it's not just that they're so ingrained that they want it to be true. I really think that it, they are truly deceived and they believe it themselves. Absolutely. I really believe that. I mean, I do know we have groups that, that will believe anything this man says and groups that will believe anything this man says and, and they'll go to the cross with it practically. But the truth is, is that deception goes beyond the ability to, to really think things through anymore. And we have we have been fed deception now in our nation and deception so long and corruption that the people really believe what they believe and you can put I mean science doesn't matter anymore no. true science does not matter anymore if you say a male is a male biologically he's a male he's born as a male yeah. you can't change that you can operate you can even even give him drugs but biologically, he's still a male, That's right. mm -hmm. period. But you offer that science today, and no, that, they, that, that's not true. They, they disregard that as being true. They disregard other things as being true that, that are true, but they change a word to make it their truth. Mm -hmm. And that's a big term they use. Well, your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. No, truth is truth. It's solid, it's rock. Exactly. And so what we're seeing now is the same thing. It's the same thing that's happened. Satan is a master of deception mm -hmm. and an illusionist. And he makes people hear and see and do what they want, to, th th what they think is going to be good for them. All the way down, even if you look at this one judgment, I mean, if you go back to this one judgment here that he spoke of um, about the... Uh, ripping open the uh, the wombs and taking yeah. it, you know, to children. Yeah. I mean, basically, that's, abortion is what's happening yeah. here. Mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, it is, it is, it is happening today, you know. It's not a nation coming against it. It's a nation that passed a law that allows it. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's the same type of mentality um, of coming in and, uh, and, 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 and doing these things. Sin is sin. It's never going to change. It's not going to ever not be sin. God's eyes and God's law, God's rules, that's what it is. And if he says it's sin, it's sin. You can never negotiate with God. So bringing this all back into perspective here, we're seeing that God is raising up a prophet from among, from among the sheep <laughs> and the figs mm -hmm. to go into a wealthy educated, high society, really. When he goes up into northern tribes at this point, the prosperity's there, they're comfortable, they're smart, they, they think they've got it all together, and here comes this country bumpkin in here, and say, whoa, God's judgment's coming. So think about that, because there are a lot of prophets out there who claim to be prophets today, and a lot of these prophets are not proclaiming God's judgment. They're proclaiming uh, prosperity. Mm -hmm. right. They're proclaiming that hey, it's all going to be good again. We're going to get it, we're going to get back what we're supposed to have, mm -hmm. and God's going to remove the, the the bad leaders and put in the good leaders. Well, the only reason they want the good leaders is because the good leaders' policies might help them make more money. Mm -hmm. And so you know, it has nothing to do with that. And and when you start prophesying those things. You know, let's go back to what it was in the Old Testament. Listen, you prophesied, it didn't come to pass. What happened? Get, Get the stones, boys. Mm -hmm. And they went to stone them. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen today. But they get away with it, and they prophesy this garbage. And when it doesn't come to pass, they, you know what they do? They blame us. Mm -hmm. Well, they just didn't believe. Mm -hmm. God, God changed his mind because of your lack of faith. So you send me more money. And it'll prove you have more faith, and then it'll happen. And people continue to buy into it. It's, it's a cycle. Sin is a cycle. Deception is a cycle. Judgment, from God's perspective, will come to break that cycle. Now, what did he, what did he do for, for us today, for the believers? He broke the cycle through Jesus. Jesus broke the cycle of sin for those who would believe. That was the first judgment of sin was Jesus himself after after the after the uh, when I say the first judgment I mean you see all these judgments here but I'm talking about the overall judgment of sin was done on the cross mm -hmm. for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe should not perish but have everlasting life. So he broke the cycle of sin for all that would believe in Jesus to go through the door that was provided to get to, to the Father and redeem in redemption by the Son. So we see that that was judgment. Where did that judgment, how do you see that judgment? Well, Jesus himself was judged. He was beaten beyond belief. He was tortured, whipped, ripped apart, and then put on that cross to die. That was judgment of sin. But there still has to be more judgment. Why? Because many don't believe in Jesus. Sin didn't stop. Sin didn't stop. Jesus. The judgment of sin stopped for those who would believe. Right. And that's why we're delivered from the wrath of God. But the wrath of God is still coming. Judgment will come. Just like it came then, just like Amos predicted or prophesied it all happened, as Isaiah prophesied it all happened, as Jeremiah, as Ezekiel, all of them, you know, if there was no repentance, judgment came. And that was what Jonah's big beef was. He didn't want to go to Syria, I mean to Nineveh, because he knew that God, if they repented, it, God would relent. He didn't want them. He hated those people. Yeah. They were a cruel, cruel people. And Jonah said, nope, I'm going this way. He finally went. And what happened? Opens his mouth, and first two, two, first day, second day, third day, next thing you know, they're all repenting. And Jonah's mad. I knew that was going to happen. Well, listen, we shouldn't have that attitude. Our attitude should be, Lord, let us be a light to non-believers, so they won't have to go through this wrath that's coming. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a prophet, but I'm speaking what the Word of God says. God's wrath is coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this just reinforces <clears throat> many of the other verses in Scripture that God won't put judgment on us unless He told us beforehand. Every mm -hmm. time yeah, we are right. aware of it, right. and so you know we, we got no one to believe in ourselves. Right. But again, just Amos in, in this, this this section here that just reinforces that because Amos is coming and telling them yeah. that this that's happening. And there's something else I just want to share. I mean, when it came up with this earthquake and uh, sharing that this is the way God. Uh, tests and, and uh, brings judgment on his people. And I, I really got caught up in this, the verse in the second verse, and it says the, the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn and the top of Carmel shall wither. I think to me this, relating that to the verse before with the earthquake, mm -hmm. I think this, this these two parts of the verse are relating to the potential of a, of a famine. Because the, the shepherds, the, the habitations or the pastures of the shepherds will mourn. What are they going to mourn about that there's no more grass there? It's not getting water. There's a, there's a, 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 a drought that's coming. And Carmel is a major water source. Mount Carmel is a major water source for the, for the Galilee Valley. And that, that's withered. So there's no more water up there either. So I think he, he's, I at least, what I got from this is that there's a famine, uh, there, there's a drought that's coming, right. and that's that's not a punishment that he puts upon uh, believers. Mm -hmm. You know, so again, there's a warning that we need to heed. Yeah. Well, I think you know, looking through, going through the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we can see God's movement, movement of how He moves. We see His characteristics. We we see His character. His holiness, His righteousness, His sovereignty, His justice. All of these things we see all the way through. And He's always consistent. Now, again, we look at things and say, well, if that were the case, why would He allow this to happen? Why would He allow that to happen? Listen, we're still in a season of mercy, too. And while these people are getting away with things right now, mm -hmm. and things are happening that are ugly, He's given them opportunity to repent. That's mercy within itself. Now, it may affect us in, in ways we don't like, and it would be easy for us to say, God, go ahead and take care of it now because it's affecting me. But is that really the right way to look at it? Because to look at it that way, we're calling judgment, judgment on someone that God may see has potentially the opportunity to turn his heart to God. And there have been many, I can guarantee you, in my past that would probably want a judgment to fall on me 
mm-hmm. before I could turn to God. I mean, it, God sees it all. We don't. That's where the real uh, rubber meets the road in a faith walk. It's putting all of these things in perspective of understanding. It's all His judgment. Judgment is mine. I will, I will judge His Lord. He's the one that's going to do it. So just be patient with Him, not so that we can see the judgment and rejoice in it, but that we know that when He brings a judgment, it's the right time for it. And He's only going to bring the judgment on those that will not repent. And, and that's proven all the way. You go into Revelation, it's very obvious. I mean, you, you can see the attitude, the hardness of the hearts. When they are, stones are falling on them, mm-hmm. and fire, and their tongues are about to be dissolved in their mouth, and they're blaspheming God in the midst of it. They're raising their fists to They're God. raising their fists to Him. They know He exists if they raise their fists. Right? And they know where this judgment's coming from. Yes. Mm-hmm. But yet, <clears throat> they will not repent. Right. That is the depraved, the depraved heart that will not return. God knows each heart, and he knows those that are that way, and he knows those that are not. So our place is, okay, God, if you're showing us this, these truths that judgment's coming, we're not to rejoice in the judgment, but we're to rejoice in the fact that you haven't done it yet, and there's still opportunity for others to come to know the Lord. Right. So that puts a fire under us, doesn't it? It does. Mm-hmm. Are we alike, or are we, uh, are we hiding under a bushel waiting for that judgment? But I really don't think that's where God wants us to be. Mm-hmm. No. We need to be out active, alive, shining the light, doing what he's called us to do, being obedient and walking out our relationship with him. And if you're, if you're called to be in Amos, you'll go stand and speak what he tells you to speak, where he teaches you to speak, and how he teaches you to speak. If you're called to be a prayer warrior, yeah, your prayer closet is your main ministry, but that doesn't mean that that's where you stay. Mm-hmm. You don't hide in a prayer closet. Got to come out sometime. <laughs> you know, and God wants to use you. And, and and think of it this way. God will give you more than one gift. Mm-hmm. I mean, he may give you one predominant or a, a dominant gift, but he, he may give you more than one gift. So, you know, be open to what he wants to do and how he wants to use you. Be willing to be an Amos. You know, be willing to be an Isaiah. Be willing to be, uh, you know, anybody. You know, uh, uh, Zacchaeus, you know, the, the uh, tax collector, whoever. Mm-hmm. God calls you from wherever you happen to be to be a light where he wants you to be. And he can use and wants to use anyone who's willing to come and be that person. And it, when they're shooting the darts at you, they're shooting at God, really. That's right. That's and right. So and just always remember those words. They're not rejecting you. Okay. They're rejecting me. And that's what God told Samuel. You know, it, so don't take it personal. Right. Just keep your eyes on me. Yeah. Keep your eyes on the prize, as Paul said. Not that I've attained, but knowing this, I've learned to put what's past is past, and to keep my eye on the prize. Keep moving forward. Amen. 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 Any final thoughts before we close? I have a question. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, I don't answer questions. <laughs> 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 where was the, book be, the, the 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 law being read at this point? They they still have. Uh, priests, I'm assuming, because mm-hmm. it's not good. Are they not reading it? Are they not taking it seriously? Is it is is their church or their temples empty? Even though somebody's standing up and reading the law. Well, I again, you got to remember there was a was it what was the king that someone found the book of the law yes. and Ezra. brought it to him. Ezra. Ezra. Okay. Ezra. He found Ezra. the book of the law and brought it to the king. Right. The king read it and had never seen anything like it. So <laughs> that answers yeah. part of your question. I'm not saying it was in the same season. No, but, but it they had they probably had the law, but like everything else, it became more of a religious thing to them. They went and practiced in the temples. They went and practiced in the synagogue, but they weren't adhering to anything. They weren't really applying anything. It was the same way with the Jews of Jesus' day. Yeah, they knew the law. Mm-hmm. They read the law. They studied the law. And they knew how to manipulate the law to get people to do what they wanted them to do. They put a lot of their own traditions in there and made it more about them and how they could get things out of it. Um, you know, just, like, just when Jesus overturned the, the tables in the temple, he overturned them not because they were selling fairly, you know, uh, doves or pigeons or whatever they would offer, animals to offer, 
But what they were doing is they were manipulating. Some would come with their own. Right. They would find a fault at it, whether they had right. one or not. Right. Tell them that it wouldn't work. Sell them another one. Take the one they had and sell it to somebody else. Yeah. That's what was going on, and that's why Jesus. So um, I do believe that, the, that I can't say in this particular season that they were actually speaking boldly and reading the law, but people weren't adhering to it because they'd become self-sufficient right. again. Right. In this season of time, God is now... He's blessed us so much. Let's just put him over here and pet him a little bit and mm. treat him as a as a as a as as that. And then when we need him, we'll get him. But that's not who God is, and that's not who we will remain. He will not be put in anybody's box. Mm -mm. Um, but yeah, that I, I can. That's that's what I think was happening. I think they we're in this season of prosperity. And again, notice he went from Judah yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. near that's Jerusalem. Right. He went up, yep. and he was preaching in to the ten tribes. And they, at that point, were doing pretty good as far as their wealth goes. So that was, that was what that was about. Yeah. And to, just to show that God can and will use anybody <coughs> at the Brooklyn Tabernacle at Women's Bible Study, a, a speaker was an ex-prostitute, and she was saying that uh, she was uh, working for this pimp, and she was on drugs and her body got so emaciated that she wasn't making any money because no one wanted her, her services. So the pimp brought her into the woman's uh, church and said, these ladies will fatten, fatten you up. And so she came and yeah, she got better, but she also got saved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he didn't see that coming, did he? <laughs> and God now uses her. It's a powerful testimony. If he can take those, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't yeah. matter your past. He can use anybody who has a heart for him. Yes. And that's a powerful testimony. It really is. The only, the only thing I've just, just real quick, we, we were just saying about that word patience just keeps ringing. This, this is a nonprofit organization. <laughs> but I just, you just could see you know, that our time. In this this country's time is is this a clock ticking? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I, be honest with you, sometimes I get filled with dread. I prospect what's going because I think about my my little end and over here and um, just the future. But the encouraging thing is our times are in His hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just how if we when the in, it's just a matter of time before the judgment does fall. I don't know what form it will take. Could be economic. Mm -hmm. Yellowstone could go off, mm -hmm. could be a tsunami on the coast, could be anything. Could be little the little he blue helmeted guys make it w way over here and, and start to you know try and run things. We don't know what's going to happen, but to be acting like we belong to him in the middle of that, mm -hmm. to be patient and still love people and not say God go get them and that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Well, and that's a hard thing because, again, you know, we're in a land of plenty. We, we've got mm -hmm. everything. We're in a comfortable place. Even, yep. I mean, even our homeless over here are better off than many yes. that live day to day in other countries. Uh, most of our homeless people have cell phones mm -hmm. um, and, and laptops. I, I visited a, a homeless camp not far from here, took them some water a couple of times, and they had their laptop and their, uh, and their cell phones, and they would get on his bicycle, and he'd go to town and charge it and ride back to their camp and that's how they live but um but the thing is is that we we have this mentality and and it's it's been developed over a period of time now that we are the chosen nation now it's, it's like we're we're it so god's not going to let anything happen to us yeah well let's go back and look at israel yeah uh, yeah he, he was their chosen nation Mm -hmm. How many times do they get get you know have to go through punishment? Yeah. Right. You know, so it's not about that. It's not about mm -hmm. the nation. It's about the heart of God's people. And right now, my message predominantly is to the church. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the church that needs to wake up. It, it's the believers that need to grasp where we are and why we're here. Because if if we really we're in a place as a whole, and I'm not talking about an individual church here and there. I'm talking about, you know, the bride of Christ as a whole mm -hmm. in the United States. I promise you this. If Jesus were to come down right now and 
separate those out of the church buildings that are his and that are not, the church would look a lot smaller than a lot of people think it is. And that's not my judgment speaking. I'm just saying, if you go down the street and ask people what it means to be a Christian, they claim to be one, half of them can't tell you Mm -mm, mm -hmm. what it means to be a believer. But they go to church. You're right. (laughs) And they they feel like they're saved because they prayed a prayer and they have all this history behind them. Mm -hmm. But but that, that that's not going to do anything. You have to have the relationship. So, so my my voice is to the church to listen. We need to get back to the basics of the full counsel of God's word, and believe that He's going to be doing something that's going to glorify Himself, and it's going to to uh, to bring light of Himself to people. And sometimes that's not going to be an easy thing to go through. I don't believe we'll go through the tribulation. But I do believe we will go through persecution. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And those are two different things. Persecution is Satan's anger toward God. Mm-hmm. The tribulation is God's anger poured out upon the earth. And his bride does not go through the wrath of God. So, with that said, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that your word is true. We thank you, Lord, that we do glean these nuggets as we go through these things. It's not easy to teach these Old Testament books because it's judgment here and judgment there and judgment here and judgment there but Lord in the midst of that judgment we we know that you are a perfect and holy God and we trust that everything that happens by your hand is the right thing to happen because again you see the whole picture and we don't so we submit to you and your will and in your plan and we trust you And we thank you and we praise you. May we be closer to you in these last days that we go through. May may our relationship with you be solid and and firm that we walk the way we should walk and talk the way we should talk and live the way we should live. Not by works, but by relationship with you. We thank you in Jesus' name.